Hey there, my name is Miranda. Welcome to Shenandoah National Park. We are in front of the Stony Man Trailhead. This trail has been hiked for generations of people and we're about to join them. It is said that Stony Man holds many stories. Not only natural, the birds and the trees and the bears, but also human stories. We're going to see what stories Stony Man wants to tell us today. Before we get started, we have to think about a couple of safety things because you can't have fun without being safe. Uh, here we have lots of ticks if you're from the area. Uh, here in Virginia, you probably already know that. And we can help that just by doing a thorough tick check when you get home. Look in all the nooks and crannies and make sure that you look for them. They can be very small, so we want to be thorough. One of the other things that we have here in Shenandoah National Park, but people love it, are bears, black bears to be specific. And if we do see one on the trail, it would be a special treat, but you wanna let the people around you know. And after that, they're not known for being especially aggressive. So we are going to leave them on their merry way as long as they're far enough. If they are on the trail, I like to let them know that, they're, that we are there so they don't get scared. So I usually say, hey bear and they either get going or just keep eating their food. So either way, we should be pretty good as long as we give them a proper distance. Okay, are we ready to go? I'm ready to go. Let's go. I affectionately call this stop tree versus rock. We have a special type of rock process happening here and it's called weathering. This here is called root wedging. It's slowly breaking the rock down. Now this rock <coughs> is part of the Catoctin formation, Catoctin. It started about 500 million years ago and it happened during a time when the tectonic plates, these hard plates, around the earth were moving around and the ones in this area were pooling apart. That's important to our rock story because slowly magma or lava eventually came up and created volcanic fields in this area. Now it didn't all happen at one time. It wasn't some giant explosion. It was rather slow, kind of bubbly, spatter cones or even just lava flows. The point of that is, is that it gave us our mountain here today, Stony Man. If you look at Stony Man, you can see these bumps on the side of it. We call it Stony Man because it looks like the profile of a man's face. And we say a man because we see a long beard on it at the end. Now, that's five different lava flows. It didn't happen in five days. It happened over thousands of years. Now, remember when I mentioned that we had stories in this area? Some of these stories happened way before humans were even around. That is the first chapter in the story of the rock that we still have here today. Let's go. We have one of our vanishing characters in the story of Shenandoah National Park. Right here we have a hemlock tree and 
it is slowly being taken over by an invasive species called the hemlock woolly adelgid. It's kind of a mouthful, but it's a sap-sucking insect that attaches itself to these lovely needles, and it kind of sucks the life out of them. Now, once a hemlock tree gets this hemlock woolly adelgid, its fate is not gonna be good. We only have a few left in the park compared to what we had back before this invasive species. Now, us rangers work very hard to try to save the few that we have left. They actually come and give medicine to some of the trees. They hook up the root system and let it slowly suck up this medicine over several hours. Now, making house calls to each individual hemlock tree is not a very efficient way to use our time. However, our rangers are trying to save the few that we have left. We have a lot of trees in Shenandoah. I don't want you to think that we're doing this for every tree in the park by any means, but it is for a couple of trees that we have. And in case you want to know if a tree has been treated recently, some of them have these kind of paint spray dots on the back and certain years have certain colors. Maybe one year, every hemlock tree that they treated, they will put a white spot on the back. Maybe another year, a blue spot. Now, depending on how much, how much funding or how many rangers they have that year, they might get to more trees than other years. But it's on a few years of a cycle to come out and treat these trees and make those house calls. In case you didn't know, many invasive species are accidentally introduced from people that travel around or maybe goods that travel around. In this case, it was accidentally introduced from another continent. Now, what are some other ways that we think that us humans might be accidentally affecting our environment or unintentionally, at least, affecting our environment? A big one that a lot of people have been talking about in the past few decades is climate change. Now, we here with the National Park Service follow the data put forth by scientists, and we see that it is getting hotter. And we also see that it's getting a lot hotter since the Industrial Revolution, a lot faster. This is relevant to our park around us because it's affecting some of our wildlife here. We already see it. Our unofficial mascot around here is the Shenandoah salamander. It's in tight competition for the black bears. And our Shenandoah salamander is so special because it's endemic to the park. That means it exists here and nowhere else in the whole entire world. Not only that, it only exists on three peaks in the park, the highest ones. Stony Man Peak, which we're on our way to, Pinnacles Picnic Grounds, and also Hawksbill, which is our highest peak. Now, why do you think it exists only on the highest areas? If you guessed because it's cooler, you'd be right. Now, if it starts getting hotter and hotter, or at least warmer and warmer, it's not a big deal for me. I can just take off my jacket. And if I get cold, I can just turn on the heater or put on my jacket again. But for the animals around here, usually they don't use jackets and they don't use heaters or air conditioners. Their environment is all they have. So if the Shenandoah salamander only exists in the coolest parts and those coolest parts are getting hotter, what do you think is gonna happen to those Shenandoah salamanders eventually? If you're guessing they're gonna run out of a place to live and they might not be around here anymore, you're right. So that is kind of a short-term consequence of how climate change is affecting our wildlife here in Shenandoah National Park. That is a current unfolding part of our story, not only the story of the mountain, not only the story of Shenandoah National Park, but across the world stage. We will see how we can kind of get together as humans to try to make a happy ending to that story. As we go along, we are going to be traveling through 
many people's adventure. Over here, if you can see, we have two what we call blazes on the tree. Two streaks of paint. This white one means that you're on the Appalachian or the Appalachian Trail. This blue one means you're on a park trail. Let's go a little further and see if we can continue along the Appalachian Trail. So far, we've been talking about Stony Man Mountain as kind of the central part of our story. But sometimes it's just one stop in the journey on a longer story or adventure. We are on the Appalachian Trail, like I mentioned earlier. This trail is about 2,200 miles long. It goes through 14 states, and it's so old that it predates even the park. It goes from Georgia all the way to Maine, or you could hike it the other way too if you'd like. And more and more people are hiking it every year. Almost 4,000 are starting it each year. Most of them don't finish, but even today we are becoming section hikers on that hike. Now, this is more than just a hike. It's an opportunity to push yourself to kind of think about why hiking feels so good and natural to you. Sometimes it's to prove to yourself that you can do it. Sometimes people start hiking on this trail or any trail and they don't even really know why. It just feels great to be out here in the outdoors, to kind of remember who you are, to hear those birds chirping. Now, a lot of people on the trail kind of have trail names. They can be names like Happy, Sunshine, Jiffy. I once met a guy right here and he had a, I said, why did they call you Jiffy? I thought maybe he was a really fast runner. And he said, actually he didn't say much. He just had this giant bottle of peanut butter right here, pulled it out, put it back in and kept on hiking. You'll find that a lot sometimes because they have to cover a lot of miles in one day if they're gonna finish it in the right time span. You probably wouldn't want to be taking too long while you're hiking this trail because then you'll be hiking it in the snow. And I don't think they brought enough kind of gear to be hiking in the snow as well. It might get really heavy. You have to carry everything that you need for sometimes five, six, seven months all on your back. You might start to think about what's really important. Now, as we diverge from the Appalachian Trail, because it is right there and continues on right there, we are going to go up this way to Stony Man Peak. Now, as we go up, think about the other uses that people might have had in the area that aren't kind of spiritual or entertainment values, but maybe more of the industrial sort of uses. Okay, let's go. I like to stop here because we have our old friend, the Catoctin Formation, and they kind of had an interplay with some of the human characters in our story. I'd like to introduce a man named George Pollock, George Freeman Pollock. Now, he was a fun character, and this rock has to do with him because a little before he came to this area, 
in the late 1800s, this area was actually mined for copper. It wasn't the most fruitful endeavor. I mean, they did find copper, but by the time they mined that copper and took it down the mountain, remember this was before automobiles, it wasn't worth the trouble. So they abandoned it. George's father, along with a couple of other business investors, bought this area. George's father had never even seen it before. So he sent his teenage son, George Freeman Pollock, up here with his dog, Dickie Daddles, to survey the area. Now, George Pollock was an adventurer at heart. He jumped at the opportunity. He didn't find anything too useful by the way of mining, but he did start his vision of making this area a mountain resort. That's what started Skyland. Now, this was in the late 1800s because by the 1890s, George had already got his business started. He started from the ground up, just with a couple of tents. But if you were to come around here today, you can see that we have cabins, a full restaurant with a beautiful view, and we have plenty of trails in the area that George used to lead his own patrons on hikes, horse trails, and sometimes fully catered hikes. They would go up here to Stony Man or sometimes down to White Oak Canyon, employing some of the local mountain residents to take all the heavy stuff. Um, it made for a very luxurious hike for the residents, Mo or not for the residents, for the visitors. Some of the people that came were government workers, um, just local people from DC, sometimes from as far as New York. But once they came up here, they were here for a while. They didn't drive up here. They usually took the train into Luray and they came up the mountain by horseback. Now, as you can imagine, this wasn't really a day trip. The shortest would really be a weekend trip, but usually people stayed for weeks, months, sometimes all summer. It became part of a tradition. This was before the park from the 1890s to right up until the start of the park in the 1920s. George Pollock and his wife, Addie Pollock, were cheerleaders for the beginning of the park. They wanted this place to be protected. And they, especially George, did want to continue on that business of Skyland. And he loved this place so much. He wanted other people to enjoy it as well. Now, we have seen a lot of different chapters, a lot of different parts of this story all the way back from hundreds of million years ago with our geology to people traveling through on the AT to maybe getting a glimpse into what the later chapters of our story may hold with climate change or the Shenandoah salamander. All of this is a lot to take in. As we hike our last few steps, we're almost at the summit, try to put this in order in a way that makes sense to you. What jumps out at you as being the most important? Why is Shenandoah important to you? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I hope it is. But I'd like you to kind of think of what you hope your influence on that story will be. Hopefully you can come out here in real life, physically and not just virtually, very soon. And we are going to go those last few steps before we get to the summit. Let's go. Let's go, we're almost there. We did it, we made it to the top. That's the end of our chapter today, but it's definitely not the end of the story. When you come up and create your own chapters, I'd like you to think about how you want your influence to be remembered on not only Shenandoah National Park, but all of our national parks. And even bigger than that, 
in the story of our earth. Thanks for listening.